OK, so hi everybody and thanks for joining us this evening. It's great to see so many of you signed up and it's a real pleasure to be able to bring this session to you. Uh, so just a little bit about me before we begin. So I'm Amy Arkwright. I'm one of three early careers managers here at Owen Mitchell. I work out of our Manchester office and I've been with the firm since June this year. I moved over from a, another law firm, so I've got um, just under 10 years experience, so I've been in and around early careers so um, somebody that's seen culture through through lots of different law firms so feel uh, that I'm a good person to speak to about culture so um, in this session we will be looking at culture and how that is at Owen Mitchell and we'll be doing this through the lens of what we do both for our colleagues but also through our communities and we'll hopefully be detailing lots of activities in terms of how we support both so hopefully by the end of the session we will have given you a real clear picture as to what it would be like to to work at Owen Mitchell as a colleague so I suppose the starting point really is just to reflect on how we define culture. It's often a word that is banded around very often, but it can be really tricky to define. And I find um, in terms of looking at that, one thing that, that's easy to put it into context is to look at it as some sort of layer that sits around employees, but it's something that's not necessarily tangible and that you can put your finger on. But what we've tried to do at Owen Mitchell through our life at Owen Mitchell campaign is really bring that to life. And this is what we, we call our colleague value proposition. And sometimes you'll hear that referred to as CVP. Um, so again, this is trying to show you uh, what it's like uh, to work here, what the atmosphere is like, and to give you some expectations of how you can expect to be treated and valued if you were an employee at Owen Mitchell. So. Um, in this presentation, uh, we will be looking at culture from the perspective of both our responsible business team, but we'll also be uh, drilling into our support groups at Erwin Mitchell, which we use to really try and drive our culture. So uh, we are joined uh, this evening by lots of key stakeholders from across the business, some uh, of our amazing trainees who are currently with us, and they're all going to be inputting into the presentation and giving you a flavour of, of what culture means to them. So we are hoping that by doing this, it will give you a much more tangible and useful opportunity to really know a little bit more about uh, Erwin Mitchells, which will be uh, much more useful uh, for, than for me to go through what could be uh, a, a rather boring presentation about our strap line. So uh, we will finish off the presentation by looking at some questions. Uh, we do have a, a Q&A function on the chat. So if you do have any questions you'd like to submit to us, please use that. Uh, we'll try to answer them as we go through, but hopefully uh, we will have some, some time to go through those at the end. And we've also got a few pre-submitted questions that if we've got time at the end, I'll be putting through to the panel. And if I can have the next slide, please. So uh, this is just a, a little bit of information about Erwin Mitchell, which you may or may not be familiar with, but hopefully it will be a good refresher if you already know it. So we are a national firm and we were established back in 1912 and we have uh, 17 offices across the UK. And you should be able to see on the screen there the offices that are highlighted are those where we actually recruit our trainees into those locations. And typically um, in, in any one year we'll have around 100 trainees and that sort of breaks down into 50 in each of the cohorts so through year one and, and year two. Uh, so that was a, a very uh, short and sweet introduction to the firm. So I am now going to hand over to Clemmie Birch who is our pro bono and volunteering program sorry, programme manager in our responsible team, who's going to talk more about culture and um, to touch on her team's purpose and also to go over what we do for our colleagues and communities. So I'll hand over now to Clemmie. Thank you, Amy. It's um, a pleasure to be here this evening to talk to you about our culture and thank you so much for joining us. As Amy noted, I'm Owen Mitchell's pro bono and volunteering programme man manager and a member of our responsible business team. 
but the role is relatively new for me, having been a senior associate in our commercial litigation department up until last year. I joined Owen Mitchell about eight years ago, um, and I'm here to um, here to talk to you this evening about the work our responsible business team does in supporting our colleagues in the delivery of our responsible business strategy and our community impact work. So on the first slide, as you can see, um, this is all in relation to what we mean about our responsible business strategy. So what do we mean when we're talking about doing business responsibly? Well, for us, doing business responsibly is our commitment to building inclusive and sustainable relationships with our colleagues, clients and wider communities. And our aim is to enable everyone to thrive and make everything we do positively impact our future. A few years ago, we consulted colleagues to help us to identify the key focus areas for our responsible business strategy. And they are, as you can see on the screen now, diversity, well-being, fairness, resilience and access by what by which we mean access to jobs and justice and the environment. And all of the work that we do and our focus as a responsible business team aligns to these strategic focus areas. We're also really proud to be signatories to the United Nations Global Compact and are committed to the 10 principles and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs as they're known. Um, the SDGs provide a framework and a call to action with the aim of ending poverty, protecting the planet and striving for peace and prosperity for all by 2030. And we believe businesses like Owen Mitchell have a critical role to play in, in achieving the SDGs. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Over the last 12 months, um, our resp responsible business strategy has evolved with the aim of focusing on the issues which are most material to our business and our stakeholders. And we have continued to focus on our governance, positioning the responsible business team, which is the team that I sit in, as a central advisory service within Owen Mitchell through new roles, such as the role that I'm in, to ensure we're consistently applying multi-stakeholder and a holistic approach to the delivery of our strategy. Um, and we've recently commenced work on a double materiality assessment and um, engaging corporate citizenship um, to, to carry this out. And that involved consulting a range of stakeholders to identify and increase um, our understanding of what the material, environmental, social and governance risk issues and opportunities are for our business. And what is the impact Erwin Mitchell can have on addressing key environmental, societal and government issues within the communities that we're operating in? And you can see on screen now a rather scary little uh, looking uh, matrix, which is actually the preliminary results of the assessment and which are contained in our responsible business report, which you can find on our website. And we're using the results of that assessment to review our key focus areas of our responsible business strategy, which we anticipate will evolve to ensure we're focused on those issues which are critical, whilst ensuring we continue to consider those that are material and highly material. If I can have the next slide, please. We're committed to measuring the impact of our work to ensure we continue to use our skills, expertise and resources to make the greatest positive impact on our stakeholders. And um, we use a range of external benchmarking tools and key performance indicators to monitor and report on our um, responsible business progress. So on the screen there, you can see some of the organisations that we are signatories to and those that we're members of or, in, or support. Also on the screen, you can see some of the external benchmarks we participate in to assess our progress against our diversity and inclusion strategy. For instance, we participate in the Disability Confident Employer Scheme and have maintained a level two and are working towards level three. We also participate in the Great Place to Work annual survey and we've been recognised as one of the UK's best workplaces for wellbeing and one of the UK's best workplaces for women in 2023 for super large employers. In terms of social mobility, we participate in the Social Mobility Foundations Employer Index, which is an annual benchmarking and assessment tool for employers and in which we have been ranked 63rd. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. 
So that's a really brief overview of our responsible business strategy. And as I say, if you're interested to find out more, you can find more detail about it in our responsible business report, which is on our website. But I wanted now to focus in on one of the two focus areas of today, which is communities. Um, so turning to our community impact work, we have a long standing commitment to supporting our local communities through fundraising, volunteering and providing pro bono legal advice for those who cannot afford to access justice. In terms of our fundraising, our colleagues raise funds in partnership with the Irwin, Char Irwin Mitchell Charities Foundation. That's an independent charitable foundation which was set up by our colleagues in 1997 and it supports those experiencing hardship and stress in our communities. And since the foundation's establishment, the Irwin Mitchell Foundation have donated over three million to good causes. Um, in the, the last financial year, in, in total, Irwin Mitchell and its colleagues donated and fundraised over £259,000 for good causes. And towards the end of the last financial year, we were really pleased to announce, and as you can see, our three new national charity partners, which are Maggie's, Teenage Cancer Trust and the National Literacy Trust, who we will be supporting for the next three years. In terms of our volunteer and pro bono work, all colleagues are encouraged to use their 14 hours pro bono, sorry, 14 hours pro rata of community allowance by taking part in skills based volunteering and activities which are aligned to our responsible business strategy. And colleagues across all of our offices choose to use that allowance in a variety of different ways, including skills based volunteering, such as reading to school children or supporting our national charity partners, such as Maggie's with volunteering. Last financial year, colleagues up and down the country across the group provided just over 6,000 6, hours of volunteering time to charities and organisations in our communities, which is which is really brilliant. Improving um, sorry, improving access, jobs and justice is a strategic priority and has been a focus of our community investment programme for many years. And we work with schools and universities with the aim of increasing social mobility and widening access to the legal se sector. For example, um, over the last year, we partnered with City University on a joint pilot mentoring programme for black, Asian and ethnic minority undergraduate law students. We've also supported secondary school students through the Envision programme, empowering young people from less advantaged backgrounds to develop and build skills and confidence by tackling social issues impacting their communities. We're also continuing to work with Prime, which is a consortium of law firms committed to improving social mobility and access to careers in, in law. And we do that by delivering Prime work placements in our offices through the support of the Sutton Trust. Um, and over the last year, we um, hosted 43 prime students. Can I have the next slide, please? So very briefly, I wanted to touch upon um, this, which is um, one of our focus areas, which is the environment and specifically net zero. We're committed to a net zero future. And in 2020, we announced our a commitment to achieving net zero by 2040. And the goals, which you can see on screen now, we will meet along the way, which you can see. We've also had um, approval of our near and net si zero science based emission targets with the science based targets initiative. And our roadmap to net zero addresses both direct and indirect impacts of our organisation and our objectives will guide our environmental strategy now and into the future. So that was a whistle stop um, kind of tour of our community um, impact work that we do within um, Owen Mitchell. But now I just wanted to touch upon the second focus area for today. So if I could have the next slide, please. And um, that is in relation to diversity and inclusion. Our diversity and inclusion strategy underpins our commitment to creating an inclusive workplace culture where all of our colleagues feel a sense of belonging and are enabled to thrive. Our diversity and inclusion strategy is focused on our priority development areas in order to enable progress to be monitored and to embed diversity and inclusion into everything that we do. So on screen now you can see that we've got three strategic priorities which are insight and impact, inclusive leadership and active allyship. But we've also identified two other areas of focus, which are disability inclusion, which is aligned to our work on disability confident and career progression, which is aligned to our work on the race at work charter. 
As part of our focus on disability inclusion over the last 12 months, we've developed our partnership with Evenbreak, which is a job board for people with disabilities, advertising all vacancies and working to host internal and external events to raise our profile as a disability inclusive employer and to increase knowledge on accessible recruitment processes. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, on screen um, now, um, you can see some of the DNI highlights for the last financial year, and I've already mentioned a couple of those when I was giving the overview of our responsible business strategy, um, including um, being ranked 19th in the UK Best Workplaces for Women 2023 in the Great Place to Work survey. Um, and I'm not going to go to, into all of those um, in, um, in any detail now because there's loads of information on there. Um, and you can read more about it, as I say, um, in our responsible business um, report. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Finally, I wanted to really talk um, really briefly about well-being because well-being is um, it, well, it really continues to be a vital element of our um, colleague commitment and our responsible business strategy and a core part of our organisational culture. So what it feels like to work here. And our focus over the last three years has been around raising awareness and normalising conversations around wellbeing. And our national wellbeing team is a network of colleagues representing a broad section of roles and experience. So data and insight have remained a key part um, of us understanding what it is that matters most, of, most to our colleagues. Um, and we do that through our Great Place to Work annual and pulse surveys, which I've already mentioned. Financial wellbeing is also an important pillar and in the last financial year we launched a new partnership with HSBC which provides colleagues with access to their financial um, wellbeing, that's HSBC's UK financial wellbeing programme. Um, and finally, before I hand back to Amy, doing business responsibility is something that every colleague can get involved with within Iwan Mitchell, from building inclusion and sustainability into normal business practices, to sharing skills and expertise with our wider communities and the community impact work, which I've talked about very briefly. I'm conscious that I've given you loads of statistics and a lot of information about what we do, how we do it and why we do it. Um, but if it has piqued your interest, all the case studies I've referred to, all the data and all the information can be found in our responsible business report. But one area I haven't touched upon is Erwin Mitchell's uh, diversity groups. So I'll now hand back to Amy, who will provide you a little bit more information in relation to them. Brilliant. Thanks, Clemmy. A really great over there, overview there and uh, I've learned some some new stuff myself. So thanks for that. So, yeah, uh, just to touch upon uh, our diversity groups, as I say, they really drive uh, culture within our firm. So in terms of the groups that we have, um, we um, have these networks because we want to obviously raise awareness. They promote conversations and they give us an opportunity to share and increase understanding of the, the groups that they're focusing on. So we do have six different groups in Owen Mitchell and they all represent different diversity characteristics and we really really do um, ensure that uh, our colleagues have the opportunities to get involved. One of the things we do from a trainee perspective on the induction that you do before you move into your seats, we invite speakers uh, from each of these diversity groups to come and, and really spend some time with our trainees and get them really involved from day one. Um, so we think it's a great way for our trainees to get involved and, and, and a really um, beneficial way to, to network throughout the company. In terms of uh, the groups that we've got, so the first group is I Am Equal, which is an LGBTQ plus group, which focuses upon issues that are pertinent to that group. Um, there's also opportunity for people who um, are not necessarily part of that group to join as allies. Uh, the second group that we've got at Erwin Mitchell is I Am Respect, which is a support group which focuses on ethnicity, culture and faith. Uh, this group celebrates and supports all the different ethnicities, cultures and faiths. And the aim really is to create that inclusive environment where we can celebrate both cele uh, celebrate similarities and differences. 
Uh, we then have I Am Empowered, which is a gender related focus group. Uh, this focuses in on issues that colleagues may face around subjects like career progression, patterns of working and also work life, work -life balance. Uh, we then have I Am Generations, which again focuses on issues around age and generational issues. Um, and this is in place to make sure that generations within our business really feel included and are valued for who they are and what they can bring. And also so that we can allow them to work to the best of their abilities. Uh, we also have I Am Able, which focuses upon disability and long term health conditions. And again, uh, this is to to um, ensure that um, those um, characteristics um, aren't a barrier to flourishing at Owen Mitchell. Um, so that, that group is, is designed to look at those issues. And then lastly, we've got uh, I Am Aspiring, which is our social mobility uh, issue based group. And this uh, really focuses on upon the relationship upon where we start in life and where we end up. Um, I'm actually a member of I Am Aspiring. Uh, it resonated to me as somebody from a working class background. Also from the role I do, I think it's really important that um, we're taking a view in terms of trainees that we're bringing into the business and also looking into the future in terms of some of the things that may affect um, building that pipeline. So um, obviously I'm, I'm looking at the SQE and, and what barriers that that might bring for that group. So I will work with the group and um, again, just just highlight any any things that are coming up that the group needs to know about. So I'm now going to come to our, our panel and I'm going to pass to Bronte, who's just going to give us a bit more information in terms of the group that she's part of. So if I could pass to Bronte, thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Bronte Cook and I'm a trainee in the quarter protection team in the Newcastle office at the moment and I'll be rotating soon. Um, so just quickly an introduction to my background to law and my route to Erin Mitchell before I go into the diversity groups as well. Um, so my undergrad degree was in law and I then did a master's degree in law, mental health and ethics. Um, and then actually worked in higher education for a while in a law department. Um, so I've kind of stuck to it, but I wasn't sure about practice and then and then came to applying to Owen Mitchell, did the LPC funded by Owen Mitchell and then started earlier this year. Um, so when I was looking at training contracts, active diversity groups were actually quite central in my mind, um, both as somebody with a long term health condition and also part of the LGBT community. It was really important to me that I knew that the workplace I was joining was accepting of both of those things um, and not just that it was diverse, but that it was actively accepting um, and not just kind of tolerating. Um, so, yeah, I've since I've joined, I am a member of I am equal and also I am able um, as part, part of those communities, but I've also um, joined as an ally or out of interest um, the I am respect and I am aspiring programs too to kind of keep on top of what they're doing because that's of interest to me. Um, I found since since joining and kind of why I joined for a couple of different prongs to that. Firstly, for the community aspect of it, so just engaging with and socialising with people that maybe have similar lived experience to me or um, I can relate to on on a certain level. Um, and that's been that's been great. But another side to it, which arguably is more important, is the ability to engage critically with the business. And and I have found that the, the kind of meetings that I've attended, particularly I'll speak specifically to I am equal at the moment, but um, I feel like it's a useful space to feedback on um, experiences or ideas. And and I've found that the fact that allies are welcome as well as members of the community means that it is open and it's not seen as this is a space where LGBT people can discuss an issue and then it never goes further. It's 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 a lot more than that and it's kind of open. Um, and I do find that the business is is genuinely interested in engaging and in engaging at that kind of level. Um, a reason that I think this is important, I mean, obviously in and of itself, diversity and inclusion is important. But when you think of as a law firm, it's not just the colleagues, it's the people that we're serving as clients and there's we have a diverse client base and it's important that we make sure 
we're inclusive in the way that we interact with them um, and the service we provide. I just think it's as a general kind of human level, it's important, but as, a, as solicitors, it's, it's also massively important. Um, it's also helped me to meet people outside of my immediate department. So particularly Newcastle is one of the smaller offices and it's been really great to kind of join these national meetings um, where you can hear from people from across the different offices, trainees up to partners and different areas of um, non-fee earning um, colleagues as well. So that's been great. Um, anything else I wanted to say? Yes. Um, I just wanted to say, I know sometimes there can be a bit of a concern that, you know, when you join a diversity group or an organisation can can show these diversity groups, but what do they actually do? Um, and it's kind of this sense of, is it just a, a rainbow lanyard and you're done? <laughs> um, there is a rainbow lanyard, which is very nice, but um, I have felt some of the things that I've engaged with since joining, um, there was a really insightful and useful session on the political climate for trans people at the moment in a I'm equal meeting and kind of, that was really helpful and gave me a lot of information that I wasn't aware of and then later this week I'm going to an I am respect session on active allyship um, in a kind of ethnicity and race perspective so yeah there's there's active things that are, that are happening that engage critically and it's not it doesn't feel to me at all like a kind of um, sticking plaster or kind of sign that you can hold up to say we've we've done a job um i think that's everything i wanted to say oh also just to kind of round that all up i guess mainly the best way to test if these are working from from a personal perspective is if i feel included <laughs> um and i definitely would say also compared to some previous places <laughs> i've worked i do genuinely feel included and respected and valued and i feel i can be myself at work presenting in a way that people probably are aware that I'm LGBT and I can mention things to do with my life in that sphere that it doesn't feel like I'm being judged or you know that I'm being held out as different for that um so yeah it's it seems to be working um so I will hand back to Amy Brilliant. Thanks so much for sharing that, uh, Bronte. Some really good insights there. I I'm now going to move over uh, onto our panel and I'm going to come to Danny Revit, who is one of our partners in our real estate disputes, sorry, real estate disputes team in Sheffield. Um, he was um, also featured in our recent CVP campaign. So Danny, if I may to ask you to introduce yourself, uh, talk about uh, what IM culture means to you. And also you are somebody that uh, helps us with our assessment process. So if you can share any insights into what you like to see in candidates, other than of course the legal skills, and also uh, what makes you think that they will connect with our uh, firm in terms of the culture. OK, thanks. Thanks, Amy. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, as Amy says, I'm Danny Revit. I head the National Real Estate Disputes Team at Irwin Mitchell. I work uh, from the Sheffield office. I joined Irwin Mitchell 32, over 32 years ago now in 1991 as a one year qualified solicitor. Uh, and so I'd like to think that I'm fairly well qualified to, to comment on the IAM culture um, in the time I've been here. Um, and I can obviously also vouch for what people say about the Owen Mitchell culture or I wouldn't be here talking to you uh, this evening. Um, in terms of what the culture means to me, I think there's a couple of things that probably jump out to me. First of all, I think there's a real sense that we're all in it together. Um, I, I am a big believer in the team ethic. Uh, and as part of that, I do try to avoid a sense of hierarchy wherever possible. Um, anyone listening intently may have just noticed that while I was introduced as a partner, uh, I did, deliberately didn't introduce myself as a partner. Um, and, it, you know, I don't tend to wherever I can. Um, I, I am the head of the team uh, and I have to show leadership as part of my job when I need to. But wherever possible, I, I do place myself as a member of the team and that's a member of a team where everyone has an equally important role and everyone is listened to. 
And, and I do think we're very good at listening at Irwin Mitchell. And, and in, in my view, we do always try to act in the best interests of everyone in the business rather than just the senior leadership teams. Now, just a quick confession, I had prepared a note to say that before I started tonight, but I was really pleased to hear what Bronte just said, um, which seems to endorse that, that it's not just me saying something, you know, coming out with it. And, and I was really pleased to hear what, what, what Bronte said then, that we, we do seem to be, you know, actually walk the walk and, um, you know, are good at listening. So that's really good to hear. Um, in terms of the second thing, as well as the we're all in it together uh, comment, um, when I was young, my, my dad instilled in me a really simple ethic of work hard, play hard. Uh, I always sort of took that through my childhood and my education. Um, and I do feel that has sort of carried on um, throughout my time at Irwin Mitchell. There's some great things that we've talked about tonight and, um, you know, really important and, and, and make it a great place to work. Um, but it's not a walk in the park. You know, we, we do have to work hard at our roles to get results. And, you know, we can only sustain the business through working hard to get to get those results. But my feeling is that we do try to inject a sense of fun and friendliness into the working day wherever we can. Not always possible, maybe when standing up in court or something, but we try it wherever appropriate. Um, and the firm, 100% provides us with opportunities to enjoy ourselves when we've down tools, lunchtime, end of the day, whenever, and there's plenty of opportunities to, to have fun. Um, it, it makes me proud um, to see both in my team and other teams that colleagues seem to enjoy each other's company when they're working together, that's good in itself, but then that seems to extend that they then want to go out together. They want to go out and socialise together after they finish working because they enjoy working with each other. Um, I'm sure there are other work environments where people have no interest in doing that unless they're forced to, but that's never been the case as far as I've seen it here in Mitchell and people like to socialise together as well. Um, just on the, 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 the other question, uh, Amy, as to what do we like to see as an assessor in candidates other than um, legal skills? Um, the most important thing I like to see are candidates who are clearly being themselves in the assessment process and showing their personality, showing their full character rather than trying to be the person that they think we want to see. Yeah, we have to accept it, everyone has the different personalities and we embrace that because in my view teams work best with a mix of personalities i think it would be very boring if we were all identical um and so i think that's that's important be yourself we're all different don't try and make yourself into someone else um in in terms of how can what makes me think someone will connect with our culture um i, th I think there's a there's a couple of things I'd, I'd, you know, I'd like to see someone who I think will work with a smile on the face. I think that really helps the working day. Um, and I want, I'd like to see someone who I think would be comfortable and friendly when engaging with others. You know, you can't work just alone in this job, especially in a big firm like Erwin Mitchell. You need to engage with others in your team, in the broader firm. And we like to sort of get a sense for someone who, who will be able to do that. You know, we're all different you know some are more confident than others but it's about being able to engage in, in your own way so so the main tip i would give um especially for any stage of an interview process i think it's just try easier said than done i know try to relax try to treat it like you're going for a coffee and a chat with someone because if you do that that's the best way for us to see how we think you would engage with others which is vitally important um, so that's 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 my main tip. I hope that helps. Brilliant. Thanks, Danny. That's uh, really insightful. And I've got a note here to call out uh, your LinkedIn post being Comedy Goal. And also, if anybody's interested in any gigs going on in Sheffield, uh, they should definitely follow you on LinkedIn. So that's my personal tip for you all. Um, so we're going to move now back to our trainees and we're going to come to Vaz, who's a trainee in our London office, also in the Real, Disputes, Real Estate Disputes um, 
department. So as a trainee, uh, Vaz did the legal work placement with us and he's also worked at other law firms. So Vaz, if I could ask you to introduce yourself, um, let us know in terms of what the culture at Erwin Mitchell is like for you and perhaps just touch upon uh, some support that you've received from supervisors throughout your training contract. Hi everyone, good evening. I'm Vaz. Um, as Amy said, I'm a third seat trainee in the London office. Uh, by way of background, I did my first seat in pensions, my second seat in corporate, and now I am in real estate disputes. Um, I did a legal work placement at Urban Mitchell, and I'll just go through some elements of the iron culture that stood out to me, um, both during the legal work placement and uh, real life examples um, at work. So what struck me from the legal work placement was, and I think this has been mentioned, there were many talks organised by the firm on the IM networks we can join, corporate social responsibility initiatives as well, and the IM Charities Foundation. And I very much got the impression that the firm had a big push for all these extracurricular activities, and that also it was a very inclusive place for any trainee. Um, what also resonated with me was the relaxed nature of the firm. As Danny said, I very much got an impression that it was a non hierarchic place and this stood out to me as well. In terms of real work examples, um, I have found that there is a culture of really investing in the trainee uh, training, essentially. Uh, to give an example from real estate disputes, we have something called lunchtime learning and this is compulsory for trainees. Um, and there's a real emphasis of having um, a more senior person kind of explain real estate dispute topics to the more junior members of the team. I did a seat in corporates and there was also a similar kind of training program there. And in that team as well, the juniors also gave presentation during the lunchtime learning sessions. There is also a separate IM Trainee Academy, um, and this is really to develop the soft skills of trainees. Um, and I really felt that the firm does value the training of trainees and juniors in general. So that's a part of the IM culture that stands out to me. In terms of supervision, it's a firm policy that as trainees, we have monthly reviews of our supervisor and there's a set agenda of things to talk about. Um, this also includes any issues we can raise, any well-being issues that we might have. And again, I can really kind of tell that there's a culture of approachability in this firm. Just by working at IM, there's really not an expectation of FaceTime, so you don't have to show your face until late every single day. Of course, if you have deadlines, there may be occasions where you have to work late but supervisors do really respect work-life balance at this firm. Um, so yeah, it's understood that you have a life outside work as well. I've never been made to feel uncomfortable for asking questions and things have been explained to me at this firm. And as mentioned before, there's just a sense of friendliness that really permeates the firm. And every time I've had a seat rotation, I felt very included in the new teams I've joined. And I would say that's what stands out to me from the iron culture. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Vaz. Again, really, really insightful and some some real life experiences there, which hopefully will resonate with a few of you. Um, so I'm going to come to Lorna now, last but not least. Uh, Lorna is a trainee in our serious injury team in, in Manchester. So uh, Lorna, you were a previous paralegal before applying for your training contract. So again, if I could ask you to introduce yourself, uh, talk about your experiences of being a colleague at the firm, uh, why it was important to get a training contract here and if you can touch upon um, how you support our communities as well that would be fantastic. Hi everyone, um, good evening and welcome. Um, so as Amy said, I'm a second year trainee in the Manchester office and um, I'm currently in my second seat. 
um, in CAPPI, which is where I did a paralegal work before my training contract. So just as a bit of a background, um, I've actually been at Owen Mitchell for about seven years now. Um, I was at the firm for around four years before I got the training contract, so it was kind of my decision to get a bit of um, experience first before trying out for a training contract to see how the firm were, the people, and also whether I liked the kind of work that I was doing. Um, before I got the training contract, I did a straight law degree at Salford University, and that was coupled by an exchange programme. So I actually studied it abroad for a year in France. Um, and I graduated with a 2-1, which is still amazing, but not perfect. Um, and I was just trying to think. Yeah, so in terms of the training contract, just a bit about that. Um, I wasn't successful um, the first or the second time around. I actually applied three times, so it wasn't necessarily that um, I kind of worked here. So, you know, you um, get a training contract straight away. It is really, really tough, just as much as it is externally. Um, and I actually um, secured that the third time, um, which was coupled by a lot of support from my team and my line manager. As you can appreciate, kind of being knocked back a couple of times really kind of sets you back you've got to build yourself back up and that you know my team that I was working with at the time really did help me um build my confidence and just kept me going and um built my resilience um in terms of my experience as a colleague at the firm as I mentioned um I do think not only my my team as a paralegal, but every team I've been in, um, seat wise, I've been in family and corp. There really is a sense of everybody's very supportive, very approachable. I've never come across anybody that you know, um, kind of got an impression that you know I'm bothering them or you know, everybody's always so open to have a chat, um, whether that be work or non-work. In terms of um, the community spirit, there is a huge community spirit in the office. Everyone kind of, you know, is very integrated. We get together um, every couple of weeks for drinks upstairs um, and it, it is highly encouraged within our office that we all kind of mingle and, um, you know, get to know each other through teams. And that does really help, obviously, promote not only your profile, but also um, just meeting other people in different teams. Um, they also have a mentor programme, which um, I wanted to mention because before I applied for my training contract, I actually approached a mentor that I knew um, that I had a really good relationship with. And um, I did think the mentorship and that programme really helped me kind of progress into securing the training contracts and kind of other goals that I had within the firm. Um, so in terms of maybe why the the training contract over Mitch was important to me and why, you know, um, I wanted to kind of keep going working here. Um, I actually didn't apply to any other firms. Um, I kind of kept, kept all my eggs in one basket, so to speak. Um, and that's mainly because at the time um, I didn't really kind of want to work anywhere else. I'd built really strong relationships here and I really wanted to kind of build on those connections and grow within the firm. Um, not to mention, obviously, the um, the experts that we have here. I did feel that I wouldn't really get the kind of training or being able to work with some of the best solicitors at Irwin's anywhere around. So that was really important to me that I kind of kept going with that kind of invaluable training um, with alongside some of the, the best experts in the country. Um, in terms of um, the I am aspiring programme, so I actually am one of the lead coordinators in Manchester for the Prime Project, and that was another reason why, um, you know, securing a training contract at Irwin Mitchell was really important because they are huge advocates for social mobility and, you know, kind of having a, a workplace that is very diverse and inclusive, literally you know there's not kind of one person that's the same everyone's from all different walks of life so that was really important to me to work at a place where you kind of accept it if you're a bit different or you haven't come from a particular background um 
And just touching on um, how we support our communities. So as I mentioned, the I Am Aspiring programme, um, I run a um, work placement programme through Prime, um, which we're actually doing in February. So the, the, the Sutton Trust, um, they allocate the students to us so we don't pick students, but we offer um, placements for students that are picked that are from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, and then we have kind of build a timetable around different um, areas of the business and so not just law. It could be HR or finance um, you know, investment, things like that. So we kind of give them a full timetable to try and get an idea of not only the legal side, but what other areas of the business that, um, you know, Owen Mitchell have uh, and it's full jam packed um, all through the week. And then we kind of have a day where we um, kind of have some downtime and spend some time with the students. So that's a really great project. I love doing that. I've done that for so many years now um, and we'll continue to keep doing that. Um, also in other ways that we support our communities um, all through, um, you know, kind of as a trainee through to a solicitor and above. Um, Erwin Mitchell offer two volunteering days a year. We are encouraged to use those. So um, just some examples of um, volunteering work that I've done in the community with those volunteering days are um, like gardening um, with one of our um, charity partners, Maggie's, which is just up the road. Um, Irwin's. Um, we've done things like litter picking, litter, sorry, litter picking uh, in the city centre. Uh, we often go down to the food banks and help sort food parcels out for members of the public. Um, and we've also done things like helping um, serve and prepare hot meals to members of the public that may be experiencing homelessness. So the opportunities are kind of endless. There's always something going on and it does really bring everybody together, um, you know, as a firm and as a community. I think that's me. Thank you, Amy. Brilliant. Thank you, Lorna. Again, some some really personal insights there. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so we have now uh, got to our last slide and hopefully uh, what you've seen throughout our presentation and speakers is that we all have uh, quite a different view on, on culture uh, and that's to be expected because we all obviously want different things out of an employer. But hopefully what you, you've seen and what's come through from the information that you've got is that we all want to work in a really supportive and acceptive work place and we feel that at Owen Mitchell we've got a number of initiatives that really help us achieve that so hopefully tonight we have uh, sort of brought that to life um, what I'd say is if you are interested in some further information, there are lots of um, videos and um, stories around life at Erwin Mitchell. So I would really encourage you to come on to our careers page on the website. Uh, you can also see the link in the slide there, which will take you through. Um, uh, a bit of a plug here, but of course our application process is now open and that's for uh, applying for training contracts and also our legal work placement scheme. Uh, we are open for applications until the 2nd of January. So lots of time to do your research, to have a look at um, presentations, to speak to people about what we're all about before you put your application in. And again, uh, you can see a link there on the slide or you can also pop over onto our Early Careers website and and you'll find the application link. I'd also just call out that we've got uh, another event similar to this um, with our trainees on the 5th of December and that's an open forum for you to ask anything to our trainees, everything around the training contract, um, culture etc. So Again, if you are interested, then I definitely recommend you signing up to that event. Um, so that's um, basically all the information that we're going to go through tonight. We have got some questions on the chat and also some pre-submitted questions. We have got a little bit of time here now, so I'm just going to go through the questions now and um, give them to a speaker and hopefully we can get through those. But if there are any other questions you want us to tackle, then um, please do put them on the chat. So um, the first question that we've got in the chat is a question for Lorna. 
and uh, the question is um, what skills did you demonstrate to secure your paralegal position before securing the training contract and what level of technical knowledge was expected of you at the beginning? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so I actually came into my paralegal role with no experience um, in that particular area. So I think in terms of um, the te technical knowledge, it, it wasn't really expected. I think um, obviously when you're given a piece of work, um, you kind of expected to have a go, but there is a lot of um, support in the team to kind of sit down, go through certain tasks with you and show you how to deal with it or how to structure things um, and kind of skills. So um, as a paralegal, I attended a lot of conferences um, with experts and um, barristers and obviously the solicitors. So you get a lot of um, skills in kind of listening, you know, typing um, and being able to kind of follow conversations, but whilst also understanding the technical and legal um, aspects of the case. So that really assisted me, I think, moving into my training contract because you are kind of expected to um, take conference notes and um, thereafter um type those up um to you know quite a high standard as um sometimes they can be submitted in disclosure at court um speaking to clients as well was definitely a skill that um really helped me um as a paralegal um especially in personal injury and um, the clients that we work with are um you know have severe injuries um so it helped me kind of adapt um to maybe a way of approaching clients or speaking to them um and that's really you know helped me um in my training contract going into the different seats hope that helps brilliant thanks lorna and uh we have a question just around well-being and and Clemmy, i think this might be be one for you but the question is who judges well-being in the workplace and what metrics do they use i mean that's a really really good question and um our well-being is um oh, hang on it's telling me that i'm on mute we can I'm hear not. you i can we can hear, hear you I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um um, it's a really good question in terms of metrics and um, mo monitoring our well-being and I touched upon in the presentation that I was giving the Great Place to Work survey and the Pulse survey. So the Great Place to Work is an annual survey that we conduct which goes through a series of questions um, and all colleagues are encouraged to complete it and it goes through those questions and the idea is that we use the data and the information that we glean from the responses from that survey to really understand what we're doing and um, what we're doing right and, um, and what we're doing that we could improve. And I gave some of the statistics earlier in relation to um, kind of um, 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 the women in the workplace and well-being is one of those um, areas where I think we um, we, we score quite strongly and in terms of our uh, KPIs and, and how we measure it, it is through the uh, Great Place to Work survey. In terms of the department that looks after wellbeing, it's our organisational development team who really lead on our wellbeing strategy and our wellbeing um, um, programmes and you can find more information about that on our website think and in our responsible business uh, report. Brilliant. Thanks, Clemmy. I'm going to come to Danny now, uh, just in terms of some of our pre-submitted questions. So we've got some questions around culture. Uh, one of the questions is, during the rise of working from home and the move to online working, how has the firm been able to maintain its workplace culture? Um, it's... I, th I think it's probably right to say it, it's been challenging in some ways because you know we have we have this the flexible working policy and there, there is no doubt that there are less you know there are less people going into the office than was there than was the case before but I think we can still maintain this culture because we encourage people you know as, as well as working flexibly and working from home which they Know, really enjoy doing and you know, working from wherever. You know, we encourage them to try and visit the office, and we try and coordinate when we're in the office at the same time. Um, and I think people 
enjoy their day, you know, while they appreciate the days working from home, they also enjoy the days in the office. Um, you know, we, 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 we sit very much open plan. We sit sort of often close to team colleagues, but then next to other teams. And, and there's a good atmosphere. You, you, know, you can meet new people. You try and make the effort when you're in the office on the same day as colleagues to go out for lunch or whatever. Um, but we can, you know, we can do it in a hybrid way. You know, if some are in the office and some are at home, you can still have a meeting. You know, we, we have a, a regular Wednesday meeting to discuss uh, between, you know, cross team to discuss business development. And you'll have some in the office and some, some at home on a big screen. Um, and yeah, you know, we, we have adapted. We've definitely adapted. And, and I think there is still a workplace culture there that we can all enjoy for those who, you know, for those who want to be in the office and for those who are working from home to still be able to feel part of the, uh, the community. Brilliant. Thanks, Danny. And um, a similar question, really. The, the question is around, is there anybody uh, with more than a decade of experience, which I think uh, you'll fa you fall into that bracket. Um, what would you say has changed mo most about the culture um, over that uh, 10 years? Have you seen any things that you'd call out as big changes? OK, so as I, go, I can answer that in, in, in two ways, really. I, th I think there's there has always been that that culture, that friendly culture that, that I talk about. And, and you know, and I, I, without going on for too long, I, you know, I sort of look back to when I joined the firm back in 1991 from a, a medium sized local firm, very friendly that I started from. And the, the sort of comment to me was, oh, you, you won't enjoy it there, Danny. It's a bit of a bit of a sweatshop we've heard there at Erwin Mitchell. Um, and Almost since arrival, I thought I don't know what they were what they were talking about, you know. And I've I've you know I've met so many great people. You know, not everyone stays at a firm for for thirty two years like I have, and the people move on. But I have so many contacts and friends still who who I know from the time at Irwin Mitchell. It just seems to attract friendly people. So I, I wouldn't say you know I think there's always been a great culture, but but you know to 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 sort of challenge myself in terms of what's changed. I think I think we are you know clearly and, and society has moved on in terms of the of the diversity. Um, and I think we we were work really hard at the diversity and I think we are I think we're doing well you know, hear so many comments about people who feel so welcome in the firm, so comfortable. Um, and I think I think that's, you know, we have really been at the forefront of that on that you know, diversity and inclusion. Uh, I think we're all you know, conscious of it and that's from top to bottom. And that's, you know, people of my age who've been here for a long time. We've all bought bought into it um, and I, I think it's great. And I think it works really well. And you just hear so many comments from people who who again, you know, back to to, to Bronte's comments. We don't just tick a box and say we do it. We we do actually do it when that's the most important thing. Brilliant. Uh Thanks, Danny, and, and I can definitely echo that as somebody that's quite new to the firm. Obviously, I was doing my research and obviously seeing lots of things around the culture and thinking, oh, is it going to live up to, to what it says in the tin? But as I say, in, in my first six months, I've been overwhelmed just in terms of, uh, of the friendliness and the uh, support that there is for the, the trainee population and for that you know real desire to make sure that we are uh, putting in steps to make sure that trainees get the best training but they're also really supported in terms of, of well-being and culture so so yeah I'd echo uh, a lot of those points there um, so uh, there is a question for me um, and uh, the question is just around the difference between the recruitment team and early careers. Uh, we do have different emails. So just to clarify that, we are two different teams. So early careers deals with the recruitment of uh, any of our trainee solicitors, any of our apprentices, etc. whereas our recruitment team will deal with more uh, general inquiries. So if you are interested in training contracts, then of course it's the early careers team that you should be contacting. So hopefully uh, that covers that one off. 
Um, I'm going to come back to uh, again some more questions around culture and I think I will come to Bronte on this one if that's OK. Uh, and the question is, I really feel that people at Owen Mitchell are friendly and supportive. Can you attest to this and can you give me an example as to when you've experienced this firsthand? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think from from what everyone's been saying this evening, it kind of answers that in short. Yes, I can attest to it. I think it has been really friendly. Um, I have never had a, a legal role before. This is my first legal role. So when I started, I was quite intimidated by the by the whole idea <laughs> of, you know, time recording and speaking, speaking to clients and particularly clients who've had really traumatic events happening and kind of how to be sensitive to that and it, and I found I was matched up with a trainee buddy um, when I first started who I still have uh, fortnightly check-ins with as I still have I'm about two months in um, but I have uh, fortnightly check-ins with them um, and it doesn't all and they stress this at the start it doesn't have to be um, oh this particular case how would I do this it can be more general just a catch-up or I mean we had a we had a chat the other day where I just was like oh today's the first day where I feel like my to-do list just kept growing and I haven't got anything done and blah. and she was just like it's okay we'll take it slowly how can I help you prioritize this um, and I came out of the meeting feeling far less stressed so I feel like that's that's kind of my example of, of where that friendliness has has been there but even just generally in the office I know it was mentioned earlier that not so many people are coming in as before um, but I have found that on the days that I come in which is around two or three days a week at the moment that's kind of by choice um, as well as having to be in sometimes um, people from teams that I don't I don't know and I don't work with will often say hello they'll often know my name which I'm always impressed by um, but yeah people walk past and say oh hi Bronte how's things going and it just feels nice um, particularly being quite new and being new to the firm because I didn't have a paralegal role before um, and new to the whole um, industry um, it feels nice to feel like people do know who you are um, and they're willing to take a bit of time out of their day and that goes from you know reception staff and partners and other trainees and just across the board it, it feels really welcoming so I mean that's obviously speaking to the Newcastle office particularly but from everyone that I've spoken to across the different offices I think that is true across the board um, yeah brilliant uh, thanks Bronte um, Another question for Guy, if that's sorry, not for Guy, for, for Danny, if that's OK. Um, um, how are you mirroring the core values in the service that you offer to our clients? Um, that's, a, that's a challenging one to answer, but I think it's. I, I would say we First of all, I, th I think the most important thing is we sort of listen. We listen to the clients. We respect the clients. I think that what we sometimes hear, you know, from clients or prospective clients, is that there are some firms who, who would would tell a client that they, that they do something a certain way. That's the way. This is how we do it. Whereas we we try to you know, back to the listening point again, but in a different way. We we try to listen. We we go to a client. I mean, we did a pitch to a client this morning. Um, and, and the first thing we did at this you know, brand new potential client was say, tell us about yourselves, you know, tell us about what you need, tell us about how you like things being done, not this is us, this is what we do, this is what we'll do for you. So I think we just sort of turn things on on, on the head and listen to people uh, and, and sort of part of that, the, the innovation, um, we uh, you know, we will always try and find new ways of doing things with clients, again, see, see what their problems might have been and, and you know why other suppliers might not have given them what they wanted and see if we can do it you know we we we're sort of cutting edge in terms of systems and so on so we'll always look at that sort of thing um our responsible business um approach is really useful in terms of aligning us with clients um a lot of, a lot of our big 
I think I'm talking on the commercial side here, a lot of our big commercial clients are very keen uh, to ensure that they are pushing, you know, on the, on the ESG front, um, you know, the diversity and inclusion front. And, you know, what we can offer with clients is that our responsible business team can speak to them. You know, it's not a, a service we charge for. You know, we, 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 we offer to speak to their colleagues, um, you know, to, to their responsible business team or equivalent. Uh, they can exchange information, exchange tips and so on. And I think the clients really benefit from that. So I think we just approach things that little bit bit differently um, and, and, the, and the clients see that and keep coming back. Brilliant. Uh, thanks for answering that one, Danny. Much, um, really clear explanation there. So I'm going to come to uh, Clemmy next. So just in terms of coming back to pro bono work. So um, how do you implement pro bono in your practice? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, so in, at Irwin Mitchell, we I'm our pro bono and Sorry, at Irwin Mitchell, I'm our pro bono and volunteering programme manager. So we have a series of uh, pro bono champions across um, all uh, our offices who champion pro bono at a local level. Um, and at a national level, we are members of Law Works, whereby we get access to pro bono opportunities, including clinics where we could get involved with um, where our solicitors and those who are legally qualified can um, get involved with clinics at a local level providing pro bono advice. Um, for instance, we've worked with Queen Mary's uh, Legal Advice Centre in our London office, whereby our employment team have provided um, um, employment advice to um, individuals um, within the um, southeast area um, um, who, but for kind of that advice, may not have been able to access any legal advice as to their um, employment um, issues, which is which has been brilliant. Um, and in terms of the other pro bono work that we have done recently, we've also worked with Law Works in relation to their Welfare Benefits and Appeal project, which is where our colleagues have gone in and supported an individual appealing to the first tier tribunal in relation to uh, one of three benefits or indeed more than one benefit um, and um, with the support of law works and their specialist supervisors there so it's a collaborative piece of work which is really great and it enables colleagues who perhaps aren't experienced in the welfare world um, to upskill the themselves and learn about a new area and support um, individuals who again but for that legal advice wouldn't have access to what their options are and that first year um, tribu tribunal um, um, process has been really successful and we've been successful with the majority of the cases that we've um, represented um, individuals appealing their welfare benefits decisions by the Department of Wealth, Work and Pensions. It's been brilliant therefore for the colleagues who've got involved with the project but also uh, the individuals who've been helped by the project. Um, so it's kind of a variety of different ways um, at a local level and also having access to national projects um, through our membership of Law Works. Brilliant. Thanks, Clemmy. That's a really detailed answer. So thanks for that. Um, Vaz, I'm going to come to you. We've got a question around uh, work life balance at Owen Mitchell. Would you be able to give us a insight as to how that works for you and, and, and how you balance that in your um, seat? Um, yes, I mean, I think I touched upon this when I was speaking before. Um, I've kind of done seats where there have been some occasions where I've stayed late, especially in corporate, for example, if they're trying to get a deal through. Um, then it's kind of a collective thing with your whole team that like you might be required to stay late. However, also in that very same team, I've had my supervisor at 530 say, let's log off and we'll go to a networking event, which, you know, they invited me along to as well. And, you know, when, as Daniel was saying as well, it's kind of a work hard, play hard attitude in a lot of the teams. Um, and there have been many occasions where I have not felt I need to stay late just for the sake of it. And that's what I would say is the work life balance from my experience. Um, I can jump in as well um, from my perspective. 
um, I don't know if it's different at all with kind of the more personal legal streams as well. So in the court of protection um, team in Newcastle, we generally, I think there's been one day where I've had to stay past my kind of expected working hours, but that was only by about half an hour. I think it, it depends for us on kind of the, the general atmosphere in the team is if you get the work done, um, that's the important thing. And if you get it done to a good quality. So, you know, the, the general working hours for me are nine to five and I generally work nine to five. Um, we also have um, flexible by choice and we take that in the team to mean um, if everybody, if, if everyone in the team is aware of, of the hours you're working, you, you can shift that to eight to four. Um, if you have something happening that evening or, or the other way around, shift it 11 to seven um, if you have something in the morning. So there is that kind of awareness that you might need to work flex flexibly on, on certain days. Um, and that's definitely taken into account. And that's been helpful for me if I've got, say, I don't know, a, a friend who had a baby who was only in town for <laughs> X amount of time and I wanted to see them that evening. Um, so I started earlier and, and finished a bit earlier. And as long as everyone in the team's aware of that and there's there's not a client need that you're kind of missing there, then um, that's kind of that's been a, encouraged as well as just accepted um, and partners do that as well as trainees and associates and everyone at different levels so yeah that feels like a, a non-scary thing to ask for it doesn't feel like you're being cheeky when you ask for that kind of thing which has been nice and surprising I wasn't expecting it to be so flexible I think. Brilliant thanks for chipping in there Bronte. Danny I don't know if you've got anything to add in just in terms of work-life balance and any tips you can share in terms of what you do with trainees. I think it's, I think it's very much as um, as as, as Vass and Bronte have said. I think I think when there's work to be done, you know, people people put the time in to do it. But you know, the the, the payoff is that flexibility. Um, you, you know, and it's the you know the classic thing is someone will say on a you know on a Friday, oh, you know, I'm I'm going off to see some friends this weekend. <laughs> you know, am I okay to leave at four o'clock? And you know. The answer invariably, unless there's some deadline they've got to do, is of course you can. That's 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 fine. You know, you you put you put the hours in um, at other times. That's fine. And um, yeah, it's I think it's 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 give and take. You know, as, as I said in my piece earlier on, you know, we like to enjoy ourselves as well. So I think you, we get you know even better when that work-life balance also includes people enjoying each other's company to relax, work colleagues' company to relax. You you know, of course you have lives completely outside Irwin Mitchell that's very important as well but there's almost you know, three bits to it um, and that's what we're always trying to achieve is that people enjoy relaxing with each other um, but yeah I think it's just it's, it's give and take have that respect for each other you know we don't expect people to be chained to their desks in the office or at home all the time and uh, we but you know we have to we have to get things done but but we're then flexible with it. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Danny. I've just uh, noticed another question in the um, the Q and A that's probably best with you, if that's okay, Danny. So the question is: uh, To my understanding, Owen Mitchell is known for their services and personal injury claims, but I'm wondering how they are expanding in the business stroke commercial area. Okay. I, I, I think. Oops. Sorry. Started answering too early. Uh, there's, there's no. There's no denying that Owen Mitchell have a. You know national reputation in the personal services area but as long as I have been at the firm we have had a large business services um, offering as well um, it's yes it, it has always been you know for many years the, the some, some of the personal services um, work that hits the headlines you, you know that, that's sort of out there we advertise on tv and so on but we've always had a lot of people you know, in the business services area and some really, really good clients. Um, and it's a, it's a, it is a smaller part of the business, but it's a very significant part of the business. Uh, and the firm continues to invest in that that part of the business. Um, and there are new, you know, we are different from a lot of the other commercial firms of our size and that we are 
pretty much a full service law firm and that is a fantastic advantage to us because you know from both angles because we don't we, we don't generally answer clients questions by saying oh we don't do that normally we can say i know someone who can do that and it works in both directions you know we can we can have a client who's the you know i might have a client who's the property director of a international property investor who wants a will writing or is just just buying a house or, or and we can and you know who, who's suffered for suffered some injury or something like that we can pass them on turn it on its head someone might have just you know gone to our personal injury team for something and then but it happens that they have a big property portfolio and they refer them to me um so we are unique in that respect in being a, a pretty much full service law firm uh, and and you know the firm the firm recognizes that and continues to invest in the business side i think oh, yeah. i answered the question was that was that the right did i answer the right question there <laughs> you, you certainly did yeah <laughs> lots of detail again thanks danny that's really great um just um, a bit of a change of topic now. So I'm going to come to to Clemmy. Uh, we've had a question just around uh, values, and the question is, how does staff at Irwin Mitchell display the firm's value on a day to day basis? Another really great question. Um, I think you can do um, display values in all that you do in your client delivery in when you're thinking about how you're talking to clients, how you're working with clients, include being inclusive, um, um, approachable um, and um, and and pioneering. Um, so from a client service delivery perspective, but also how you engage with uh, your colleagues internally, just from how you um, work with your colleagues on a day to day basis. Um, and of course, in all the community impact work that we do, we're displaying our values um, by um, working with organisations and third parties and um, charities that display similar values and um, are aligned to our purpose of navigating life's upside, um, life's, life's, life's ups and downs. Um, so there's there's a multitude of way that you can demonstrate that you are um, demonstrating the values um, through kind of all, the, all from client service delivery to um, our work um, externally. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Clemmy. Just looking through to see if we've got um, any other questions. We are now quite close to time now, but we have had a question in the pre submitted questions just around whether there are any communities for Canadian staff. Um, we don't currently uh, have a, a group to support that, but I think one of the great things about Owen Mitchell, if it is something that is really important to you, then uh, it is within your gift to, to go out and, and set that up. So as I say, uh, nothing is off limits. If it's something that we need to support, then uh, we would uh, um, definitely uh, look into that. So, so yes, hopefully that answers that. Um, we've also had a question just in terms of um, the support we give to people with disabilities. Um, Bronte, I don't know whether it's something you might want to touch on in terms of your own experience, in terms of some of the support that you've had, if that's OK. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in I obviously can only speak to, to my own experience, but in, in my experience, my uh, condition that I have is a mental health condition. Um, and during the onboarding process, once I got the training contract, when it actually got very close to the start start date and we were kind of at this point of signing contracts and things like that, um, everyone has an occupational health appointment that is set up by Owen Mitchell. Um, and so I had mine and at that appointment disclosed my condition. Um, and because of that, I had a follow-up appointment where I actually had a telephone call with with a m medical health professional um, to discuss that. And I was really impressed by how that went and how that's kind of then fed into how I've discussed that with my line manager and things. So um, the that professional wrote a letter to Erin uh, Mitchell setting out the adjustments that I would need um, and, and and everything like that. And then actually during my first week, I had a, a meeting with my line manager and we worked through, I think it was called a wellbeing passport, but essentially it was a document setting out um, any differences that I might kind of experience 
um, compared to other employees and different things that I would find more difficult and adjustments I would need or time off for hospital appointments and anything like that. Um, and I feel like that was taken very seriously. And, you know, I know who to go to if I have any questions and um, it hasn't felt like it's been an issue at all. It hasn't felt like it's kind of been a big arrow pointing at me being like the difference. Um, so, yeah, it, it seemed to me, in my experience, a very structured uh, way to encourage disclosure because I know that for some people, particularly say for mental health conditions, they feel they can't disclose things at work. And that's definitely been a concern of mine at, at other um, employers. But I think the the fact that everyone has that occupational health appointment um, and that in that appointment, you know, disclosure is encouraged. It's reassuring that once you've disclosed it, something is actually done practically to help support you. Um, and yeah, it has been really structured and really helpful. And whilst I haven't had to um, kind of go to my line manager with any specific issues so far, I know that I can. And she's made that very, very obvious. And in any one to ones or follow up chats we've had about other stuff completely at the end, she's always said, and is there anything that you need to discuss, you know, in terms of this condition or any any adjustments or just how are you basically um, as, a, as a kind of more straightforward way of putting that. Um, but yeah, so in my experience, it's been it's been really good. And obviously there's the the diversity group as well. Um, I am able, um, which is a great place to discuss concerns if people do have them or just to kind of chat to chat to people who have similar similar lived experience as well. Brilliant. Thanks for sharing that, Bronte. That's really, really helpful. I don't know if there's anybody else on, on the panel that might want to share anything around in terms of disabilities, or I don't know whether we think that Bronte has covered that. Anybody else want to chip in at all? The only thing, oh, I'm going to wait till it turns. I'm live now. The only thing that I wanted to add, um, I mean, Bronte's covered it off um, ama amazingly and been really generous in what she shared um, on the call today. Um, um, and she's already mentioned our um, um, diversity network group that supports it. And the only thing I wanted to add to that was that we are a member of Business Disability Forum and we've got access to resources to support our line managers to support colleagues with disabilities and to help our teams um, to embed disability inclusion within our teams. Uh, so the Business Disability in Forum provides a wide range of um, resources on different disabilities and specific disabilities and conditions and there's some toolkits and information there. And then we also have got some um, guidance um, and information for colleagues around s support and reasonable adjustments. Um, but I think Bronte's covered it all off and what she explained. Amazing. Thanks, Clemmy. So I I'm just looking at the questions now and I think the ones that we've got left are more to do with our application process. So. Um, because we've already done a, an event that sort of focused on those questions, I probably won't go through those questions now. But what I would say is if um, you are interested in finding out more, then we have had quite a few of these events. One is focused on the recruitment process, all the criteria around that. So I'd encourage you to, to have a look there or, or to drop us an email at our early careers um, department as well, and we can come back to you on that. So unless there's anything that the panel want to share in terms of any last um, things around culture, uh, I think what we'll do is we'll wrap it up a little bit early. Um, so final call to the panel in terms of anything you might want to, to add. No, we're all good. Great. OK, well, thank you so much for joining us, Seaman. Thank you to our amazing panel for sharing some really personal information there, which I'm hoping um, you all found really useful. I'm hoping again that that's given you uh, a flavour of, of what we are, what culture is. And as I say, um, if, you, if you want any further information, you'll find lots of resources on our early careers. Um, website and also there's an option to to drop us an email so again thanks for joining everybody and um, yeah do get in touch if you've got any queries <laughs>